Hey guys, before we jump into today's video, I wanted to give you a quick explanation as to what's going on. So for unknown reasons, YouTube has flagged two of my recent videos, which has resulted in my YouTube channel getting one strike. Now, when I look into why this is happening, there's not a whole lot of explanation on YouTube's side and customer support is almost non-existent, which is unfortunate. But yeah, that's the reason you guys are seeing this re-upload. Some of you have seen this before. Many of you have not. Maybe give it a thumbs up and uh, help us out in that way. All right, let's get to the vlog. What's up guys, welcome back to the poker vlog. Currently reporting from this music home studio that I put together to talk about a few sessions I played last week at Hustler Casino. Three different sessions, three different streams, and they were all a bit different in their own way. So instead of doing a video for each one and try to get as much YouTube content as possible, like a smart content creator would, I'm gonna put them all together and just make one long video where I go over the most interesting hands. Before we jump into those, however, a couple of quick announcements. Number one, this channel finally crossed 150,000 subscribers, which is insane when you think about how many people that actually is. And I just wanted to say thanks to each and every one of you who have shown any amount of support throughout this journey. And if you're watching this and you're not subscribed, maybe click that button and let's get that 200,000 mark. Maybe this year, probably not, but we can all dream, right? Also, before I forget, last video was the 200th vlog that's ever been uploaded on this channel. I didn't even notice until after it was up. And I feel like reaching a milestone like that is at least worth mentioning. So cheers to 150,000 subscribers, cheers to 200 videos. I'm gonna keep going strong, but as you guys can probably tell based on where I'm relaying this information from, I've got other hobbies as well, in particular uh, music production and creation. I'm actually in a band. Believe it or not, it's like a rock slash pop metal. Maybe it's not so metal, it's just pop rock type of thing. We're working on new music on a daily basis, producing, recording, etc. cetera. Um, so stay tuned this year, I will be releasing music from you know my band's channel, but I'll make sure to let you guys know when we have new music out. And also we're hoping to play some live shows throughout the LA area. If things go well, fingers crossed, you know, we'll go to other states and other cities, but for now, we're just gonna look to play smaller gigs later this year throughout LA. So if you guys are interested, maybe leave a comment down below. And like I said, I'll make sure to keep you guys posted on that. If you don't like music, you're just here for poker and gambling and such, then that's perfect because I've got nothing else to talk about. Let's go to the casino and go over some poker hands. All right, guys, here we go again, starting off the night with 2550 100. In this particular vlog, we're gonna be blurring my opponent's cards. I know some of you prefer this approach, so you guys are gonna be following along in my shoes. Here we go. In the first one, Zio raises to 300, and it gets around to me in the big blind with Jack-10 suited. A very pretty and playable hand. I think there's merit to both re-raising and just calling. This time I take the aggressive route. I make it 1500 bucks. Zio makes the call in position, so we go heads up to a flop of 8-4-3 with one heart. Not the best board ever, so I think the times that I do bet, I want to bet bigger, since I would be checking fairly often on this kind of texture. I decide to bet two-thirds the size of the pot, and Zio makes the call. Not exactly what I wanted to see. Definitely would have been fine with taking it down right here, right now, but seems we're going to have to play some turns or rivers. Starting off with the eight of spades on the turn. Not my favorite card, of course. Uh, he's going to have an eight more often than I would, but at the same time, he's going to have tons of hands that float on the flop and are still going to fold on the turn. So I think either decision makes some sense here. This time I decide to check it. Might have bet it if I was in position, but I just checked this time and Zio checks it back. So we're going to a river, which is the eight of clubs. Interesting run out here. I think generally speaking, I'm gonna have stronger hands than Zio would in this spot, but it's close. Be that as it may, he's still gonna have plenty of hands like ace high or missed draws that we can get folds from, since of course Jack high is losing to a bunch of those. 
So I throw in a bet of 5,100 bucks, making it look like I've got a pocket pair or maybe even ace four or ace three suited, hands that might go for some thin value. Even might go for some super thin value with ace king being the nut no pair hand on this board. Zio seems uninterested in all that rationale though because he calls after a bit of thought and ends up winning with his ace 10 of diamonds. We start off the night with a tough beat. Nice call from him. In the next one, Henry straddles to $300. Will limps in from early position, and then Alec Torelli makes it 1300 in late position. Gets to me on the button, and I've got ace, jack, off suit. Not really strong enough to call, even though we are on the button, so I think the best course of action here is to fold sometimes and re-raise sometimes. Well, if it's in the vlog, you guys can probably guess that I re-raised it. I make it 2,600 to go, that's right, a minimum raise, which might look a bit odd to you guys, but it was mostly based on the fact that Alec Torelli had a really short stack when you consider that the big blind is just $300 in this case. So I didn't want to raise to a point that would commit me if he jammed all in. So that's why I made it 2,600, planning to fold if he jammed for his 13K. But he does not, it gets back to him and he just calls. So we go to a flop, which looks pretty good to me. It's King, Six, Deuce, Rainbow. Gonna give me most of the advantage. I could have ace, king, aces, pocket kings, king, queen, you know, all that good stuff. So when he checks, I decide to bet small. 1600 bucks, right around a quarter pot. Alec makes the call and we see a good turn card to continue bluffing on. It's the queen of clubs. I could still have all the aforementioned strong hands and now we've got a straight draw to go along with it. So he's got around a pot sized bet remaining. He checks and I jam it all in there. Alec does not seem to love it. He folds after a bit of thought and we get it through versus his pocket nines. And with that, we move to what I think is one of the more interesting hands of the night. In this one, the stand-up game is on, and Eric here on my right is one of the last two players remaining who needs to win a pot. So I'm not surprised to see him limp in for the 100 bucks, trying to get in there, see a flop, and hopefully win somehow. I looked down at queen six suited, the spades variety, on his direct left, Good enough for a raise against what I consider to be like 80% of hands that he might be limping in with. So I make it 400 bucks. Everyone else folds, so we go heads up to this flop of Jack, nine, six with one spade. We've got bottom pair and some backdoor possibilities. So when he checks, I continue with a bet of 300 bucks and Eric makes the call. Turn card is the king of diamonds, which looks like a good card to continue betting in my opinion. I could have queen 10, I could have a king, I could have a bunch of two pair and set combinations. I could have, you know, just all sorts of stuff. And we can target folds from a jack or a nine, which I think are the most likely holdings after Eric check calls on the flop. Since if he had anything super strong, he might have check raised. And also I think he might have check raised with some draws as well. So all that in mind, I elect to continue betting since I think this is a good hand to do it with on this kind of board. In terms of sizing, I would generally be over betting with strong hands, so I decide to do the same thing here. 150% the size of the pot, 2,400 bucks. Eric thinks for a bit, which isn't too surprising. If I had a jack or a nine, I would hate this spot in his shoes. But then he ends up doing something I definitely did not expect and check raises to a very small size of $6,500. What in the world is going on? This doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me because if he had a really strong hand, why would he raise against such a large sizing that I took on the turn? He probably wants to continue feeding me rope. So I think most likely he's just full of it here. I also think if he had a really strong hand, he probably would have just check raised on the flop instead of waiting for a scary card to come on the turn. I mean, this should be pretty scary for him. Now, okay, yeah, I'll be the first to say he could just have queen 10 offsuit, but one, I think he most likely would have raced pre-flop with that hand, and two, I've got a queen, which makes that even less likely than I already think it is. So my spidey senses are telling me that something is up. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm not, let's see what happens. I make the call and we go to a river card, which it's not the best ever, it's the three of diamonds, which does introduce the backdoor flush possibility. But aside from that, it shouldn't really change anything. Eric seems undeterred, however, and now throws in a bet of $15,000, a pot-sized wager, and here we are with just a measly pair of sixes, which is not feeling too great at this point. My initial reaction is, of course, to just fold, since this isn't a super strong hand, and I could have some stronger hands to call down with. But then I start really thinking about it, and I realize... My analysis on the turn, for the most part, is still intact here on the river, meaning if I went with my gut on the turn, nothing should really have changed on this river card aside from potential backdoor flushes that come in. 
And those hands consist of, let's say, a hand like six four of diamonds or six X of diamonds, really any six of diamonds with another diamond. If he had nine X of diamonds, I suspect he would have just called on the turn since he's still beating a fair amount of bluffs. So yeah, he's really just not representing a whole lot. And usually when that's the case, I get a little bit curious. We lose to a bunch of hands on this exact board, like I said, but none of those hands I think he would have played in this way, including two pair or straights. So after much thought and deliberation with my exact hand, I think we have good removal to straights and two pairs. And of course, a pair is a pair. So I decide to make what I consider the hero call. And it turns out we're good. Eric says, you got it, so I turn it over. Still a little bit unsure if we're getting bluffed by a better hand, which does happen once in a blue moon. It's always a nightmare, but not this time. Eric has 10-7 offsuit for a missed straight, goes for gusto, and ends up running into a guy who doesn't know how to fold. So luckily it works out this time, and we take down this nearly $45,000 pot. And with that, we move to the last interesting hand of stream number one. In this one, I make it 400 with 8-6 suited. Henry calls on my left and Will makes it 2k on the button. Gets back around to me and I'll be the first to say with a suited gapper out of position you probably don't want to call too many re-raises but it's Will and who doesn't want to beat Will in a pot? I mean come on. So I make the call, Henry gets out of the way and we go heads up to a flop of jack jack 8. That gives me two pair so now we're beating all sorts of ace highs and such. I check it over to him, he bets small and of course for the reason I just mentioned. We are going nowhere just yet. I toss in the money, and we see an interesting turn card. It's the six of diamonds, giving me the coveted three pair. For those of you guys who aren't super familiar with poker, of course, my two pair is counterfeit, as there are two jacks out there. So this doesn't change the strength of my hand whatsoever. I check it again, and now Will checks it back. I think that's indicative that most likely we have the best hand, since he probably would have continued betting, but I wouldn't be too surprised if he pot controlled with a hand like aces or kings, maybe even pocket tens, you know. So anyway, we go to a river, which I'm hoping is a clean one, but it's kind of not. It's the queen of spades. Granted, like I said, we could still be beating hands like ace king, ace ten suited, but, you know, he could also have ace queen or king queen suited, these hands that get there, if you will, on this river. So I think in terms of what I should do, a block bet is appropriate. Could be doing this with super strong hands, trying to get value from ace highs. Could be doing this with weak hands like the one I have. And I think it's just a generally good way to play all the hands I would have in this situation on this kind of board. So I throw in a bet of 10% the size of the pot, 800 bucks. And now Will gives us some thought before raising to 4,000. Back to me now. And of course we're getting a great price. We're beating potential bluffs. So calling doesn't seem like the worst thing ever, but I just don't think he's bluffing nearly ever, given how the hand played out. I think it's most likely he checked back the turn for pot control with aces and kings and now is going for some additional value since he doesn't want to miss out on that, considering I only bet 800 bucks. Or maybe he got there on the river with ace-queen, like I said, king-queen suited, and also decides to go for value with a hand like that. I don't blame him for doing that, but now it's back on me and it opens up some really interesting possibilities because like I said before betting 10%, we could be doing this with really strong hands. And I think if I had a full house like pocket eights or pocket sixes, which I would certainly play the same way, I would for sure be going for another raise on this river. So that means we should also have some bluffs in this situation. And I think we've got the perfect hand to do it with. We have removal to pocket eights, to pocket sixes. I could have jack eight suited once in a while, considering that the jack of clubs is not out there. So yeah, I mean, it's not every day you run into a situation where you have the perfect bluff hand. This is one of those times, so I decided to go for it. I make it 15,800, trying to target folds from big pairs or any queen, hoping we don't get snap called, and luckily we don't. In fact, Will seems quite frustrated with the situation. And after a few minutes, he decides on a fold with ace queen. Honestly, I don't envy his spot. I most likely would have folded too, since you just don't really beat a whole lot. And luckily we encounter a perfect situation where we're able to get this bluff through. Very happy with this one. And that brings an end to stream number one. Here we go into stream number two. On this day, we are playing 50-50. No limit, that is the game that I actually put together. But anyway, in this first interesting hand, I look down at ace 10 suited. There's a raise to 200 from Dylan. I re-raise to 600 on his direct left. And then Mike pumps it up to 2000 from a couple of spots on my left. Interesting situation when it gets back to me. I think ace 10 suited 
Could go either way, honestly. Folding is probably just fine. But it's Mike X, and I want to give the man some action. Maybe I'll get lucky. Maybe we play a big pot one way or another. Heads up to a flop of queen, 10, 6, no diamonds. So we've got middle pair with the best kicker, but no backdoor flush draw. You know, not the best spot. But when I check and Mike bets small, 1,200 bucks, we are beating some hands at this point, like ace king, ace jack, and, you know, maybe a smaller pocket pair. So I make the call and we see a great turn card. It's the 10 of spades giving me three of a kind. Now, immediately I consider leading out on this one since it's generally a better card for me than for him. But considering all the raising that happened pre-flop, I'm not sure if that concept still applies here. So I decide to check it. Mike checks it back and we see the seven of diamonds on the river. Pretty straightforward bet at this point. We're representing a pretty strong hand or not much at all. So I think that means we got to bet big. I put in a bet of $7,000, the size of the pot. And Mike doesn't waste too much time before calling. Looks like good news to me. And sure enough, we sucked out against his pocket nines and start off the night with a nice $20,000 pot going our way. In the next one, there is a raise from clue to 200. And then the recycler, a living legend, makes it 800 in late position. Gets to me on the button and I've got ace four suited. Given all the action that's already ahead of me, I think folding is what I should be doing most of the time. And in fact, it is what I'd be doing most of the time. But I think, you know, once in a blue moon, getting after it is not the worst thing ever. At bare minimum, we'll be giving action, even though, you know, most likely this is a punt. So I make it $2,200 to go on the button. Gets back around to the recycler, who doesn't seem to want to commit his entire stack with whatever hand he re-raised originally with. But he also is not folding just yet. So he calls and we go heads up to a flop which looks pretty good for me. Ace, eight, three, rainbow. So we've got top pair, no kicker. There aren't any clubs out there, which I don't love, but you know, top pair is top pair. He checks and I bet 1400 bucks. Recycler makes the call and we go to a turn, which is the Jack of Hearts. I don't really love that he called on the flop because I think most likely if he's calling this flop, he's got an ace. And if he's got an ace, that means he's got a better one than me. Let's be honest here. He does not have ace deuce. So when the jack comes on the turn, I check it back. And we see an interesting river card. It's the three of clubs. So now we're chopping with some stronger aces, like ace 10 suited, if you will. But when the recycler leads out for $8,000, I am just not loving this spot. We're losing to ace king and ace queen. We're losing to any potential full house, like pocket aces or pocket jacks. And of course, ace jack is a potential as well. So yeah, I don't know. I've got a top pair, but I don't love it. In the end, I end up folding and luckily we avoid disaster as my man recycler turned a set of jacks and river to full house. So we avoid some potential pain there on the river. Moving right along to the next one. Suited Superman puts on the double straddle to 200 on my left. That means I am in the $100 straddle. There's a few limpers for the 200 bucks and I look down at six, five of diamonds. I think just completing the additional 100 and seeing a flop is the best course of action with a hand like this, but this time I decide to get adventurous and raise it up. There's a bunch of limpers, so I think good things can happen if we get aggressive once in a while, even with a hand like this. So I make it 1400. DJ Washburn calls. Nick calls and Francisco calls, so not exactly what I was hoping for. Until we go to a flop of 963 with two diamonds. Wow, that means I've got a pair and a flush draw. Not bad for getting out of line pre flop with six high. Be that as it may, we are out of position, and this board is way better for the limpers than it is for me. So I decide to start with a check. DJ Washburn checks, Nick checks, Francisco checks. Going to a turn, which is another improvement. Seven of diamonds, we've now got a flush. And it's time to start building this pot. Always tough to do out of position, multi-way, but I think step one is throwing chips in there. So I put in 1800 bucks. Washburn makes the call, and the other two guys fold. Off to a river, which I'm hoping is a clean one. And sure enough, it's exactly what we get. The deuce of hearts should change absolutely nothing. So of course, I'm happy to go for some more value here. I think best sizing on boards that are pretty sketchy like this, especially with flushes available, is usually around half pot. There are exceptions, but in this instance, I don't think we should do anything but that. So I put in a bet of 4,800 bucks, and now DJ Washburn thinks for a while before raising to 15,700. He probably is trying to light some money on fire here with a hand like 
ace of diamonds x you know some other type of card in there that missed the river and now decides to turn itself into a bluff maybe he had like a pair and the nut flush draw on the turn and now decides to try to steal the pot away so of course i call rather quickly and get shown bad news despite being confident that we were going to win this one we are up against the nut flush ace four of diamonds a bit surprised to see him limp in with that hand pre-flop. That was another part of the reason I felt pretty confident on the river is because I assumed if he had a suited ace like this, he would have raised pre-flop, but what the hell do I know? Nice hand, Mr. Washburn, and we get coolered here for a decent chunk. Kind of puts a halt to some of the momentum we were building on this night. But no matter, because despite this being the last fun hand of this stream, we have one more day to go through, and boy was it an interesting one. Starting off with this firework of a hand, tonight the game is 50-100. There's a straddle to 200 on in this hand before Dr. H makes it 550 to go. Gets to me on the button and I've got queen nine suited. As mentioned earlier in this video, I think when you have a hand that's a little bit too weak to play multi-way, Best options are to either fold or re-raise and get aggressive with it. Most of the time I would probably fold, especially against Dr. H who doesn't mess around too much, but I decide to raise it this time. I make it $2,000 to go. Gaston cold calls in the big blind and Dr. H calls as well. So we go three ways to a flop of queen, jack, four, rainbow. Once more, we've got top pair, but no backdoor flush draw. When it gets to me, I decide to bet small, 2100 bucks, mostly because this is just a good board for me, and of course, I've got top pair. So I put in the money, and now Gaston makes the call, and Dr. H makes the call as well. So when both of these guys call, eh, I'm going to tread a little bit lightly on the turn. Three of clubs shouldn't really change much, but when it gets to me, I decide to check it back and see what happens on the river, which is an interesting one. It's the nine of clubs, bringing in king 10 for the obvious straight draw on the flop, bringing in the backdoor flush draw, which I think is almost irrelevant, but of course also giving me two pair with my queen nine. Gaston checks, Dr. H checks, and it gets to me. Well, if either of these guys had king 10 or a flush, it would be a pretty sneaky check. I think most likely we've got the best hand, so I decide to go for some value. I throw in $7,800. Now it gets to Gaston, and he decides to jam all in after some thought for $21,000. Dr. H does not snap fold, but he does eventually fold, and now it's back on me, and man, is this a tough spot. We lose to all sorts of hands. Like I said earlier, he could have king 10 or he could have a flush but man i mean why would he check that on the river it's not like he could be hoping to check raise after i checked back the turn my hand looks like it's just gonna check back on the river anyway right at least that's what i think so yeah i don't really know what this guy is up to that said how often do people check raise all in on the river as a bluff in live poker it happens almost never especially for a good amount of money like you know $21,000. So yeah, I don't love this spot. I can't put him on a hand. I don't really understand what's going on in this one, but I'm trying to put the pieces together. And in the end, I just don't really think he's going to be playing too many value hands in this way. Gaston is also someone I played with a few streams back and he definitely showed some heart then. I know he's capable of bluffing. When all those factors combine, I think it equals a call, even though it is a pretty close spot. So that's what I do. I toss in the call and we get told that we're good. He shows ace jack of diamonds and we're gonna start off this high stakes Friday taking down a $55,000 pot. In this next one, action gets to me on the button with nine eight suited. I open it up to 300 and then Nick Airball makes it 1500 in the small blind. I make the call with a playable hand in position. So we go to a flop of queen six two with one club out there. Nick Airball continues for a bet of 1500 bucks. And with a hand like mine, I think you could mix between occasionally raising, occasionally folding, and occasionally calling. Isn't that something? I mean, jokes aside, I really do think that. We've got some backdoor potentials with the six of clubs out there. And, you know, raising also has some merit since we have to balance out hands like sets that we would raise with. Of course, folding also makes sense because we got nine high and the six of clubs isn't actually all that good. Probably better to have the seven of clubs out there 
or, you know, just an actual good hand. So, uh, yeah, all options on the table. This time I decided to take the uh, lowest frequency one, if you will. I raise it up. 5500 bucks. I think this also makes sense considering that Nick is someone I perceive to be betting a little bit too often in situations that I think should check sometimes. But anyway, I make it 5500 and now Nick Airball shows me exactly what a terrible play that was because he bumps it up to like 20000 or whatever it was. I, of course, fold right away. A little bit upset with myself for lighting 5500 on fire, but I guess once you see the cards, it makes sense because he flopped himself top set. Terrific timing on my behalf, I know. In the next hand, we are once more going up against Nick Airball. Action gets all the way around to me in the small blind. I'm in the 50. I call the additional 50 with Jack-10 offsuit, playable hand. And Nick Airball makes it 600 bucks. I make the call, once again, playable hand. We go to a flop of ace-ace-queen with uh, not a whole lot going on for me, aside from a straight draw. When he bets 300 bucks, I think coming along for that price makes sense. So that's what I do. And we see the miracle on the turn. It's the king of diamonds giving me Broadway in a spot where I would almost never have a hand like that. I check, and now he bets another $300. Even though I do have a super strong hand, this isn't really a board that I would be check raising too often, given the pre-flop action. So I decided to just call. And we see the deuce of spades on the river. I check it again, hoping that Nick bets, and sure enough, he does $500. Now, I think I've played my hand to make it look like I've got a queen, maybe even a king once in a while, and maybe, just maybe, Nick has an ace, and we can get maximum value from that hand by making it look like I've got a bluff through a check raise. So that's what I do, $3,000, hoping it looks to him like I'm turning a pair into a bluff, trying to get him to fold an ace, but I don't think he would fold an ace too often. And then all my thought process goes out the window when Nick Airball raises again. He makes it $10,000 to go. That is definitely a code red alarm going off in my head because, you know, I could have the occasional ace myself. So why would he be putting in another raise? But then again, Nick Airball does have some creative bluffs once in a while. And I think my hand is probably just a little bit too strong to fold. I don't really want to make hero folds too often in this game. So I toss in the money and that's bad news. He's got ace king for the stone cold nuts. We get coolered. Maybe I could have found a fold on this river if I was a little bit better at poker, but I'm not. So we lose this one. Life goes on. And it goes on to this next one where I raise it up to $500 with seven, three of spades. A little bit too loose, probably, even though we are like five handed at this point. But a couple of people make the call and we go to a flop, which instantly rewards my poor decision making. It's ace, nine, eight, all spades. We flopped a flush. Man, it's been a minute. I think it's been like three months since I flopped a flush or something. Yeah, poor me. I know. Anyway, it checks to me and I'm going to bet because I have five of the same suit. Dr. H makes the call and now Brown Bala check raises to $3,000. I've played a good amount with Brown Bala, and immediately I am afraid when he check raises this board because he's just a little bit too tight of a player. I immediately just think he's got a value hand. And if he's got a value hand, he probably has a higher flush than I do. Let's be honest. If he had a set, he probably would have re-raised pre-flop with pocket aces, nines, or eights. So, yeah, I immediately don't love this situation, but I make the call, of course. I still have flop to flush, so can't just fold it on the flop, right? I'm not Johnny Vibes. Dr. H folds, so we go heads up to a turn, which is an interesting one. It's the deuce of spades, which I guess will now let me off the hook if he continues betting. But he now bets $1,200. Really small size, and against such a tiny bet, I don't think folding really makes sense. So I make the call and we see the 10 of hearts on the river. Now Brown Bala checks. And at this point, I start to realize that maybe he did have a hand like pocket eights. Most likely he's got a hand that has me be like a jack high flush, I suspect. So yeah, I think about betting for value for some time. But in the end, it's just too thin, even in my opinion. So I check it back and we end up beating two pair ace eight offsuit. Was surprised to see him check raise that on the flop. I don't know if I would do that, but this guy, I'm sure, knows stuff that I don't. So, yeah, we win this one and avoid what I thought was a cooler on the flop. And that, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to the last interesting hand of today's vlog in its entirety. In this one, Sandor raises to 300, and I defend the big blind with ace-four offsuit. We go to a flop of ace-ten-deuce-rainbow. 
top pair is top pair. So when I check and he bets 200, I am going nowhere just yet. Turn card is the king of clubs. I check again. And this time Sandor checks it back. River card is the four of spades. What do you know? We suddenly have aces up. That is two pair, not a hand you see every day. So I decide to go for some value, hoping that he thinks I have some sort of bluff and calls me with maybe a king or some sort of ace that, you know, check back the turn for pot control. I put in 1400 bucks, a pretty big bet, making it look like I'm full of it. But of course, I'm actually full of a really good hand. But then Sandor does something unexpected and raises to 4000 this is really weird because if he had a really strong hand, why would he have checked back on the turn? Well, maybe it was exactly for this reason in hopes of getting me to bet the river so he can get some extra money out of me. Or are we getting bluffed here? Is he realizing that, you know, his pair of kings or maybe his pair of tens is no good? So he's bluffing with a hand like king queen or jack ten. Sandor can be a tricky player. I don't really know, but... For whatever reason, my spider senses were telling me that this was not a good deal for me. So I make what I consider to be a super tight fold, at least for me. Aces up, going in the muck is not something I do very often, but I do this time. And luckily, it turns out he had ace king for the turned two pair. So we almost lose a big one to end the night, but luckily, I guess, lose the minimum. You know, I could have checked fold of the river, but then I'd probably be cheating. So anyway, that ends the night. As always, I hope you all enjoyed the hands. Right, so as you guys just saw, a lot of poker was played and in the end it worked out for me. I lost one of those sessions and won the other two. When you take all three together, I ended up profiting around uh, 40 to $50,000, math is hard. But here are the uh, results for the three sessions. Take all that and that means we had a good week and even better when you consider that I am now working on the passion project that is this band. Actually finishing up our first ever track that we've professionally recorded and produced. I don't know if professionally is the right term because we didn't hire any professionals. I'm the one doing all the mixing and mastering. But it seems like a professional environment in here. So I'm gonna go ahead and use that word. This song should be out soon on all platforms like Spotify, Apple Music, etc. I'll make sure to keep you guys tuned in on when that happens for those of you guys who are interested. And like I said, if you're not interested in music, then I feel really sorry for you. Probably not the right YouTube channel for you because I will be incorporating a lot of band stuff moving forward. That's life. My interests don't only consist of No Limit Texas Hold'em, believe it or not. But for the time being, this will remain a poker channel actually forever. I'll just start another channel if I want to do other stuff. That's all I got to say today, guys. Before I ramble too much, get out of here. Thank you for all the support, and I'll see you all next time. Peace.